It is zero hour for health care reform. Democratic leaders are scrambling for votes so they can pass the Senate bill, a vote they said could come by next weekend. Well, tomorrow the president heads to Ohio for another campaign-style event to sell his plan to the public. Joining me now, senior White House advisor David Axelrod. David, thanks so much for being Jay, here. Good to be here. So, David, by the end of the week, will you have the votes, and how are you going to get them? House Democrats say they're not there right now. Look, I, it's, I believe we will have them. It is a, uh, it's been a long and arduous debate. It's a tough issue uh, for uh, members of Congress because there's an enormous lobbying campaign uh, going on on the other side. Uh, uh, a lobbyist from the insurance industry descending on Capitol Hill like locusts uh, and, and uh, trying to pressure people to vote. Uh, against uh, this bill. It, there's a lot of pressure on people, but I believe that we'll be there at the end of the day. Okay, well, um, the man whose election in January changed the political scene here in Washington, Republican Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown, over the weekend had this to say about health care reform. Somehow, the greater the public opposition to the health care bill, the more determined they seem to force it on us anyway. You know, their attitude shows that Washington at its very worst, and that the presumption that they know best, and they're going to get their way whether the American people like it or not. Now, David, pluralities, if not majorities, of the American people do oppose this bill. Doesn't he have a point? Well, first of all, let me note that Senator Brown comes from a state that has a health care plan that is similar to one that we're uh, uh, trying to enact here, and that people in his state are overwhelmingly in support of it. He voted for it. Uh, and, uh, and, and says he wouldn't repeal it. So we're just trying to give the rest of America the same opportunities that the people of Massachusetts have to get health insurance at a, uh, at a price they can afford. Uh, this, uh, this bill is important to the American people, Jake, and when you get underneath the numbers and you ask people, do you support uh, giving people more uh, uh, leverage against insurance companies uh, so that they, uh, if they have pre-existing conditions, they can get coverage, so if they get sick, they don't get thrown off, so they don't have uh, these huge uh, premium increases of the sort we've just seen announced in states around the country, they say yes. When you say, do you want to give small businesses and people who don't have insurance through the job the chance to, to get uh, uh, insurance in a competitive marketplace where they can get it at a price they can afford and give them tax credits to help them do that, uh, they say yes. And when they say, should we reduce the overall cost of the health care system over time, they say yes. But that's the program. That's the plan. And, uh, and uh, it is important to the American people uh, that we have the fortitude to go ahead against it, to leave the politics aside, to leave the partisanship aside, to resist the special interests and get the job done. But according to polls, the American people don't agree with what you the think. The polls are split, Jake. I mean, one of the interesting things that's happened in the last uh, four or five weeks is that if you look at the, if you average together the public polls, what you find is that the American people are split on the top line, do you support the plan? But again, when you go underneath, they support the elements of the plan. When you ask them, does the health care system need reform, uh, uh, three quarters of them say uh, yes. When you ask them, do you want uh, Congress to move forward and deal with this issue, three quarters of them say yes. So we're not going to walk away from this issue. The biggest thing, though, is, and this is the way Washington measures these fights, how will it affect the election? How will it affect the president? Uh, the question is, how will it affect the American people? We know what's going to happen if we don't enact it. You saw in California, 38 percent rate increase just announced. In Illinois, up to 60 percent. Uh, we know that 10 million more people will lose insurance in the next 10 years if we don't uh, uh, act. We know small businesses, uh, there's a new study coming out that says a third of small businesses that currently give insurance to their employees are going to have to drop it in the next decade uh, if we don't act. We know what's going to happen if we don't act. So the real question is, will the American people win or lose, not how it affects the politics of this town. And, and act this week. If it does not work this week, is that the last chance for health care reform? Well, I, I believe it is going to happen this week. I think we're going to have a vote. And the American people are entitled to an up or down vote. We don't want to see uh, procedural uh, uh, gimmicks used to try and prevent an up or down vote on this issue. We've had a long debate, Jake. It's gone on for a year. The plan the president has uh, embraced and has put forward is one that, that, that takes ideas, the best thinking from both the Republican and Democratic sides, this marketplace where people can buy insurance who don't have it today, a competitive marketplace, that's an idea that both sides embrace. The place where we don't agree is on whether there should be some restraint on insurance companies or whether they should be allowed uh, to run wild. We believe there should be some restraint. Uh, uh, some on the other side don't think so. One of the, the things that the president has acknowledged the American people don't like about the bill as it exists right now, the Senate bill, is all the special deals 
that are in there for individual senators to win their vote. The president has directed the House and Senate to remove those from the fixes that you guys are creating. But some members of the Senate and the House are pushing back. They want those deals. Are you ready to pledge that none of those deals or any other deals that other members might be trying to get as this is being pushed through the House, that none of them will be in this final bill? Well, look, the president does, uh, uh, does believe that these uh, uh, state-only carve-outs are... Uh, are, 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 should, should not be in the bill. There are, there are things in the bill that apply to uh, groupings of states who satisfy, for example, in Louisiana, uh, uh, the, what, what has been portrayed as a, a provision uh, relating to Louisiana says that if a state, if every county in a state is declared a disaster area, they get some extra Medicaid funds. Well, that would apply to any state that uh But we're that not talking about Louisiana, that. we're talking about Montana, we're talking about $100 million for a hospital the principle should in be, Connecticut. The principle should be, uh, does, do, do these provisions apply to everyone? In other words, are there things that, that, that pertain that if a state uh, satisfied a certain set of circumstances, they, they, would, uh, they would qualify? And I, I think that's, uh, that's different than a special state-specific thing. In the case of Nebraska, uh, what everyone was outraged about was that it seemed to be a special deal just for one state. That's not going to be in this bill. So none of the things that are state-specific to win the votes of individual senators, Louisiana not counting as that, but none of the others will be in the final bill. The, the, the principle that we want to apply is that are these, uh, are these applicable to uh, all states? Even if they don't qualify now, would they qualify under certain sets of circumstances? I don't want to get into a whole debate about reconciliation because I know uh, that Republicans have, have used it in the past. That's the, the measure to pass a, a bill in the Senate uh, with a majority vote instead of 60 votes. But the, the provision is supposed to be used to reduce the deficit. So is the administration saying that the fixes will reduce the deficit more than the Senate bill already does. Well, well the, the CBO is still running through uh, the various provisions. Well, it certainly will. We believe that it'll be similar to uh, the Senate bill in the sense that it will uh, reduce the uh, deficits over the first decade by something in the order of $100 billion and over a trillion dollars in the second decade. So there's no doubt that what we're doing here will help reduce uh, the deficits. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why it's important that we act, because health care costs are the single greatest upward pressure on, uh, on the federal deficit. House Democrats are talking about using a procedural maneuver to pass the Senate bill in the House and then the fixes without ever actually having a vote on the Senate bill. Here's Congresswoman Lynn Woolsey, a Democrat of California. I don't need to see my uh, colleagues vote for the Senate bill in the House. We don't like the Senate bill. Why should we be forced to do that? Can the president support a procedure where the members of the House pass the Senate bill without ever voting for the Senate bill? Well, I, look, I think everybody's going to be on the record uh, by the end of this week uh, on, uh, on these matters. And, uh, of course, in answer to Congresswoman Woolsey, uh, the president's proposal uh, is not the Senate proposal. With the, cor uh, with the corrections that have been made, with the improvements that have been made, some uh, including Republican ideas, some including Democratic ideas. Uh, this, is a, this is a different proposal. I think it addresses some of the concerns that, uh, that people have had. But when pushing reconciliation in the Senate, the president has talked about how the Senate bill deserves an up or down vote. Shouldn't health care, Senate... Jake, health care deserves an up or down vote, and health care uh, will get an up or down vote. Remember, we already had up or down votes in the House or Senate, and Senate 60 votes in the, uh, in the Senate. Uh, the bill passed the House as well. Now the question is, do we pass the, uh, uh, the requisite uh, uh, improvements to this bill and so corrections to this bill uh, to make it even stronger? And I think we will. So the parliamentary stuff doesn't matter. It's just a question of whether or not the overall package passes. What, is, what does matter is that uh, people uh, cast an, uh, are allowed to cast an up or down vote on the future of health insurance reform uh, in this country. We've had a year, uh, enough game playing, enough uh, uh, maneuvering. Uh, let's let's have the up or down vote and give the American people the future they deserve. I want to talk, change to a couple other uh, subjects. Uh, first of all, President Obama, during his State of the Union address, uh, criticized a Supreme Court decision with the Supreme Court sitting there uh, this week. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts had this to say about how he felt at the time. The um, image of having the members of one branch of government uh, standing up, literally surrounding the Supreme Court, cheering and hollering while the court, according to the requirements of protocol, 
has to sit there uh, expressionless, uh, I think is very troubling. Doesn't Justice Roberts have a point, not on the substance of what President Obama was saying about the decision? Obviously, the president can say whatever he wants, but doesn't he have a point about the appropriateness of that setting? Uh, you know, I really don't think so. And I think Justice Roberts is a, a student of history. You know, if he looks back 100 years, uh, 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 Theodore Roosevelt said of Oliver Wendell Holmes on, after he made a decision on an antitrust case that he didn't believe in, uh, that Roosevelt uh, thought was a bad decision. He said, I could carve out of a banana a judge with a stronger spine than him. Uh, so things have been said about justices by presidents in the past that were far more personal than anything the president said here. But thinking about Teddy Roosevelt, I wonder what he would think about a bill that essentially allows for a corporate takeover of our elections uh, or a court decision. And that's what we're dealing with here. Under the ruling of the Supreme Court, any, any, uh, any lobbyist could go into any legislator and say, if you don't vote our way on this bill, we're going to run a million-dollar campaign against you uh, in your, uh, in your uh, district. And that is a threat uh, to our democracy. It's going to further reduce the uh, voice of the American people here, and it's something we have to push back, back vigorously on. All right, last question. Vice President Biden uh, went to Israel this week, and he was uh, greeted by a slap in the face, the announcement by the Israeli government of uh, the approval of new housing units in an Arab section of Jerusalem. President uh, Obama was said to be very upset about it. Vice President Biden and Secretary of State Clinton made very strong comments about it. Will there be any consequences, tangible consequences, beyond the tough talk? And does Israel's intransigence on the housing issue put the lives of U.S. troops at risk? Well, look, uh, this, uh, what, what happened there was an affront, it was an insult, but that's not the most important thing. What it did was it made more difficult a very difficult process. We've just gotten proximity, so-called proximity talks going between the Palestinians and the Israelis, and this seemed calculated to under, uh, undermine that, and that was, uh, that was distressing to everyone who uh, is uh, promoting the idea of peace and security uh, in the region. Israel is a strong and special ally. The bonds run uh, deep, but uh, for just that very reason, this was not the right way uh, to behave. That was expressed uh, by the Secretary of State as well as the Vice President. I'm not going to discuss uh, what diplomatic talks we've had underneath that, but I think the Israelis understand clearly uh, why we were upset and, and uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what we want uh, moving forward. I hate to say this, but yes or no, David, does the uh, intransigence of the Israeli government on the housing issue, yes or no, does it put U.S. troops' lives at risk? I believe that that region and that issue is a flare point throughout, uh, uh, throughout the region, and so I'm not going to put it in those terms, but I do believe that it is absolutely imperative, not just for the security of Israel and the Palestinian people, who were, remember, at war just a year ago, uh, but uh, it is important for our own security that we, uh, that we move forward and resolve this very difficult issue. All right, David Axelrod, Senior Advisor to President Obama, thanks so much for joining Good us today. Good to be with you, Jay.